And I'm very happy to welcome our next guest, Kerry okay. Thwin Evans, CWE. Actually, a first question uh, to Kerith. Kerith Wynn Evans. Welcome, Kerith. The first question I wanted to ask you is, Michel Buteau wrote this remarkable early text called The City as a Text. It's a text which, when it came out in the 60s, had immediately a huge impact on the world of art. Dan Graham and other colleagues of his in America read it. And I was somehow wondering if you could talk about this whole idea of the city as a text. Well, it's a big one to start with, but uh, and much has been written and many foolish things have been written about this easy analogy to make and the clumsy metaphor that can be made from the notion that uh, cities somehow operates or constitutes a text. I would rather probably uh, be more comfortable with interrogating the notion of text than the notion of city uh, in that what kind of uh, text, what does text constitute, uh, what does city constitute, uh, but essentially it's rather uh, profoundly romantic and late romantic and rather banal idea of uh, really the idea of the city being some kind of form of spectacle that presents itself as some form of kind of narrative textuality. Uh, I think my interest in this initial uh, prescription is problematized by my, if I can use a word which is never used anymore, haptic experience of uh, various cities and various different texts. I'm, I suppose uh, on uh, an autobiographical level, uh, I suppose I'm interested in texts that I can't really quite fathom or understand or texts that maybe language that expands the uh, possibilities of comprehension of where I might be. You know, another great writer about this has been uh, Michel de Certeau in his uh, practice of everyday life. So, um, yeah, there's lots of work to do. Um, and I suspect they'll, the more interesting work will be done by women, actually, on this subject. Why? Uh, because uh. I think there's... Uh, there are prejudicial gender conditions in relation to language. I'm thinking of the way that Judith Butler talks about architecture, which she does actually rather rarely, but very profoundly when she does. Or Beatrix Colomina. I mean, my heroes, actually. Uh, I, I like listening to women talking about things like this because it's such a cock rock subject. Beatrix Colomina will be here actually in the pavilion on the 18th of August for a discussion with uh, Thomas Demand. Maybe to follow up, one of the things which actually has been kind of recurrent over the last sort of 10 hours or so have been links, various kind of links to uh, situationism. And we sort of came at a certain moment, Rem was wondering if maybe what Guy Debord was to France, Cedric Price would be to England. Wow. Uh, no, much more. Cedric, yes. Guidebo, maybe. Yeah. But we were wondering about your kind of uh, uh, relation to the sort of situation is uh, kind of ideas. It's obviously, again, a little bit the big question, but it would be nice to hear. Yeah, it's turning really nasty now. Can we be a little bit more optimistic? Um, I think the whole... Uh, 
You know, I came to London, if we can uh, speak a little bit about tying it back into this kind of remit in relation to the city. Also, I came to London in 1976, where I was uh, exposed to the city as a kind of text, which was in some uh, cultural uh, shift, some excitement, largely through popular culture and uh, music and fashion, etc. Guidebaud was sort of introduced to me by uh, brainy art school teachers and uh, they thought that it would sort of somehow correlate and kind of chime with my interests by providing me with some kind of form of art historical uh, legitimacy. Uh, subsequently, I've learned to loathe and love Guidebaud. I've learned to identify partially with certain uh, romantic impulses, namely in his kind of confessional voice, which is one of a kind of ancient authority, and his notion of citation, as I think, profoundly uh, well-versed. Uh, however, the, my uses of Guy Debord, unlike the uses that we had this conversation not long ago with uh, my mentor, John Stezica, John still believes that Guy Debord has something to say. I think Guy Debord had something, has something to say. No, I mean, I think he had something to say. Uh, so to that extent, it, I think reading Flaubert is as interesting as reading Guy Debord. And I think this revolt into style has become somehow uh, predictable, to say the least. So uh, in as much as I can have appreciated in a kind of uh, melancholic imaginary gene, uh, the in Girumimus Nocte et Consumimur Igni especially, the bleating of a sick old man, you know? It's, uh, there are very interesting correlations. Arto is much more interesting than Guy Debord. Uh, Guy Debord was a phony, and I think that's not such a bad thing to be either. So I have a um, complicated relation to, <laughs> to that. Uh, I have a question. Um, basically, uh, I'm stuck in a profession where I think uh, being critical is, is almost impossible. I wouldn't uh, call this building stuck at all. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, do you think you, where, how, do, how do you think you can be critical in, in art and how do you think you can be critical in architecture? Well, the means of uh, uh, attempting to or feeling the need that this critical capacity is uh, de rigueur are problematic also. I mean, I'm with you, but it's something that I've struggled with in relation to, at the same time, I'm almost falling into the grumpy old man position of going, why be critical, no? Uh, there's this, oh, I really want to say this now because it's oh. such a <laughs> fuck up. <laughs> The Arts Council is celebrating, I'm sorry everyone from the Arts Council, but they're celebrating, I don't know, 600 years or something of their kind of patronage, literally patronizing. And they're doing this exhibition and they bought a piece of work by uh, my good self, which takes its, it's, um, it's a little bit complicated and some people will know what I'm talking about. Anyway, there's this uh, great big vast Venini chandelier made by the great uh, uh, Achille Castiglione and uh, first made for the first class Alitalia lounge in Milano airport, right? So the likelihood, I always dream, the likelihood of Sophia Loren drinking a Negroni under this is very high. Uh, managed to obtain this marvelous relic, and uh, it 
somehow promotes and carries this text, which is a diary entry from uh, 1968 to 1975, edited version of uh, the great John Cage's diaries. And the title is, How to Improve the World, and in brackets, you will only make matters worse, right? <laughs> now, the blathering English idiots at the Arts Council have decided to call this kind of retrospective exhibition at the Hayward Gallery, all fine, and I'm sure there will be really, really seriously marvelous things there. They've said, they've robbed my title. Said, yeah, yeah, we're really happy with your piece and the bastards. They wouldn't lend it to our show in Paris. They wanted to keep it. So I said, ah, oh, yeah, okay, fine. So they've called the show how to, <laughs> how to make the world a better place, but they've left out, you will only make matters worse. <laughs> So, so much for, you know, humanist do goody goodies. Ugh. Okay, uh, I'm being a bit playful. No, no, if, no, can no, I ask no, you a question? I, 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 yeah. And what's this like? How did you decide how to do this? Or, you see, I haven't been here earlier. Maybe like every other person has asked you about the interview marathon. And uh, I'm really, honestly, genuinely proud to be part of all of this because I think it's a great event. But yeah. I'm not yeah. asking, yeah. but uh, how did you decide who you should ask? And, of course, Kathy and the gang who have been super sovereign because they've had to, like, put up with people who have... I don't know, babysitters or weird diets uh, in order to uh, make it all possible. You mean how personal is this yours? Yeah. Um, uh, partly, only partly, kind of a, maybe a third. Uh, and there is another um, third that I think is very personal to, to Hans Uri. Mm. And the rest is some kind of statistical emergence uh, that we were very curious to encounter in my particular case. Do you know this marvelous poem by Robert Frost? Hmm? Uh, it's a, a totally anecdotal, and I hope I'm being a kind of bit of light relief, because I'm just not really interested in being very serious this okay. evening. But uh, there's a poem called Stopping by the Woods on a Snowy Evening, and I wish I could remember it. He could remember it, because on the inauguration of uh, JFK, okay. Uh, he'd written, he was somehow the White House's poet laureate at the time, uh, and he'd left his notes in the car or something like this, right? So he couldn't remember the poem that he'd written at this great important historical occasion, which has become subsequently, and uh, much to our uh, embarrassment, we look back at this kind of moment within American democracy, which is actually much more optimistic than what has subsequently emerged. Uh, but Robert Frost couldn't remember the new poem, right? And the only thing the doddering old guy had Parkinson's disease or something like this, said, oh, and he was super embarrassed and sweating and whatever, and very, very nervous in front of like the world's media at the time, which was tiny compared to now, mm -hmm. said, but there's one thing I do remember, and it's this poem that I wrote in, I don't know, 1942, called Stopping by the Woods on a Snowy Evening. Right, which is the most extraordinary thing to send into this, uh, uh, this historical process of in inauguration. I'm not going to be able to remember it. I can remember the first couple of lines and the last couple of lines. It's a very short poem. I only looked it up yesterday on the internet. You just have to put in the title and it just appears. I love archaic poetry on the internet. especially John Donne on the internet is specifically fine. Right? Uh, Rilke also, uh, fabulous, and the typefaces that they choose, it's really bizarre. Anyway, uh, whose woods are these, I think I know, uh, is the beginning. For he lives in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here on the ba -ba -ba, longest night of the year. And most fantastic fucking line in a poem ever. My little horse will think it queer. 
<laughs> to stop without a farmhouse near, he gives his harness bells a shake to see if there is some mistake. The only sound is something breeze and downy flake. But I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Actually, Rem, do you have more questions for Karis? No. Yeah, I have my only recurrent question, but Karis, I'm kind of embarrassed because I've asked you this question so many times before. But I'm kind of asking it to you again tonight because I think it would be great to hear about your yet unrealized projects, or at least one. Maybe if there are London projects, unrealized London projects? Uh, well, since you live in London now, I thought it would be really good to uh, raise money from the British Council and the Arts Council to maybe uh, <laughs> yes. get... Uh, I, totally I thought, it. you know, I mean, I think yeah. it would be... A, a, I'm a huge fan of Orlan, so I think it would be really great if you had a sex change, Hansori. <laughs> <laughs> Many thanks to Kerry Evans. Thank you. Yeah.